Hello my dears, I think this video is probably going to be another slightly long one, but I'm not mad about it because I'm excited for the video because today we're going to be discussing what autistic people tend to find funny, why I think that is the origins of that specific kind of humor, how that connects to today's comedy, and what we can learn from that. So basically my whole argument as to why Commedia dell'arte is the most accessible form of humor, um, and also like any subsequent iteration of it. Because I was gonna write a paper about it when I was abroad, but then I didn't need to, so I just have had these notes sitting around. Also, if you don't know what Commedia dell'arte is, you're gonna learn about it, and you're gonna realize that it's genuinely shaped absolutely everything, and your mind's gonna be a little bit blown. But before we get there, hi there, hello. If you're new here, my name is Sydney. I am an openly autistic, queer, disabled, trans, non-binary actor, composer, educator, and advocate, and I'm working on a thesis about accessible theater education and psychology and performance and everything possibly in between, um, and it is culminating in the world's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. You can learn about all of those things at the links in my description. Also, everything that I'm learning about accessible education I'm making into a video series also linked there. Audio description for friends who need it. I'm a white person in their early 20s with uh, shoulder length, light brown curly hair. I'm wearing a white shirt, um, and I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf, and that bookshelf also includes a stuffed animal, Red Dragon, that is directly to my left. So yeah, glad to have you. You're welcome to like, comment, subscribe, leave a super thanks, whatever you want, but no pressure. Let's get nerdy. I'm gonna try to contain myself though. Um, I will not talk for an hour straight about Commedia. I'm liable to do so, but I'm not gonna. So, all right, autistic humor, we're starting there. There's this myth that autistic people don't have senses of humor and that we are incapable of understanding jokes or whatever. That is very much not the case. Um, Hannah Gadsby is an incredible autistic comedian who is world known. Um, there's also several other incredible autistic comedians. And also, my autistic friends are some of the silliest and goofiest people I know. But for the sake of this video, I read some of the horribly ableist research on autism and humor, and it was bad. Um, but what I learned is that research shows that children with autism are more likely to exhibit solitary laughter, meaning that they laugh when alone in response to stimuli that do not typically evoke laughter in others, rarely laugh in response to others' laughter unless attempting to echo the sound and rarely attempt to intentionally make others laugh. And solitary laughter, yeah, very much. I have so many inside jokes with myself and I am liable to burst into giggles at the most inopportune in times. Um, for example, when I was at senior prom, somebody who was not nice came up and yelled at me for no reason and I didn't know how to respond and so I just started laughing in her face. And then the rest of the dance, people were coming up to me to congratulate me for being the one who finally stood up to the bully which is completely unintentional, but you know what? Autism, baby. But the whole autistic people rarely laugh socially or intentionally try to make others laugh thing is from the outside probably what it looks like if you don't know the autistic experience, but that is not what is going on internally. Also, we do socially laugh, just less often than non-autistics because it takes a lot of energy to fake a laugh and to seem comfortable around non-autistics. And also, autistic people are hilarious. And when I'm around a group of people I feel safe with that are very funny, I will laugh 24 seven. Um, but, but when I'm around people who aren't funny, I just, I just don't laugh. It's not that I don't have humor, it's just that you're not funny. But before we can talk about that, what is humor? What do we see as funny? The majority of what makes people laugh is incongruity or things that don't match up to each other. That's why seeing a child in a tutu um, is cute and seeing an elephant in a tutu is hilarious. Or why you're more likely to laugh if I go, yeah, my favorite colors are yellow, purple, and goose butt. Um, rather than if I were to be like, oh, my favorite foods are mac and cheese, pasta, and chocolate, because you're expecting a boring list of colors there, and then I said goose butt. That is unexpected. That is going to make you at least internally smile, if not externally smile or laugh. And that is that thing is different. It's surprising. It doesn't match up with the situation that you thought was happening, so therefore it's unexpected and we find that humorous. And that is basically the root of absolutely everything that is funny, more or less. So why do autistics typically laugh at inopportune times? Probably because we see things that totally don't match up and are so wildly absurd and incongruous that it makes us crack up. But we notice patterns very differently than other people do, so other people might not even see that those two things don't match up to even find that funny. One of the most common stereotypes about autistic humor also is that we don't understand sarcasm. Um, and in reality, it's not that we don't get it. Conceptually, it does make sense to us because autistics can sometimes be the most sarcastic people. The problem is that we have a hard time reading the social cues to know if a person is genuinely being serious or if they are making a joke. So therefore, we don't find it funny because we often miss the social cue that, oh, that comment was supposed to be a joke. And this also goes for dry, straightforward humor as well. We can't tell if other people are joking or not unless they make it 
pretty obvious or we know that person really well. However, autistic people tend to dish or give out, I don't know. We tend to do dry humor and sarcasm really well because people generally see observational comedy, aka stating the obvious, as a form of comedy. So when an autistic person walks into a room um, and says something very unexpected that is perfectly logical to them, other people are going to see that as incongruous to the social norms of the situation, so they find it hilarious, and we don't understand that we've made a joke because we are just stating something that we've observed. Or we can intentionally make a joke and have it come off really dry because people often perceive autistic affect as very flat. And that brings us into conscious humor. We can and do intentionally make jokes all of the time. Most autistic people at a pretty young age found themselves in several different situations where they said a straightforward factual thing and everybody laughed like it was a joke and they started to want to spend more time with this autistic person because they found them funny. We notice patterns, we realize this is happening, and we understand that we can break social awkwardness by getting people to laugh with us, and that people will keep us around even though we don't say too much. So we start to pay attention to what people find funny, and we start to script jokes to help with our own social anxiety and situations, because we know we can break the tension that way. Or we steal them from places. And I think that we all know somebody who has stated a joke from something without the wider context and didn't realize that the context actually matters for the joke to land, and then been in a really awkward situation. Or the class clown that is absolutely acting out and all over the place and, you know, is funny but also utter chaos. They don't understand when they need to stop the joke because it's the only way that they're getting positive attention from other people. Also, we've talked about autistic speech patterns before in this channel. Our brains are very creative in accidentally switching up and combining words and phrases in a very funny way, completely naturally. So we just say those things out loud for a laugh, or we learn to fabricate those things to, similar to other things that we naturally created for a laugh. And obviously a huge part of comedy is being able to read the room, which autistic people often really struggle with. But we are a more adaptive group than you think. We figure out how to manage. And if a joke doesn't land, a joke doesn't land. And we try again, or we just run in the opposite direction, move to Alaska as a, as a goat farmer, change our names forever. But generally, um, autistic people are seen as weird, and people tend to see weird as funny because it's often fairly easy to do. But why don't we laugh at a lot of things? Well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, social laughing can take a lot of energy, so we don't always do it. Um, especially if we're not sure that a thing is supposed to be funny because the time that everybody else is socially laughing, we're just like, there was a joke? What, what was, what's funny? What is, why, why are we laughing? Um, sometimes jokes are genuinely hard to follow. So by the time that they get to the punchline, I've forgotten everything else, so I don't find it funny because I'm just trying to put the pieces together. But also, a lot of the time we get the joke, it's just, it's not funny. We, we don't think that it's funny. A lot of humor right now is cringe comedy and or is mean. Not just right now, always. A lot of humor is just mean or cringy. And if I'm with a group of people and they show a compilation video of people getting hurt and they're all giggling and laughing because it's funny, I'm not laughing because I'm spending that time being like, are the people in the video okay? And also, why do my friends think this is funny? You are clearly terrible people. Or when jokes are just thinly veiled complaints about minority groups or just mean things to say. I get that it's supposed to be a joke, but it's just point blank not funny because it's, it's hurting people and that is not funny. And then we have cringe comedy. Research has shown that laughter for cringe comedy is more similar to that of nervous or tense laughter than like, ha ha ha, funny laughter. Um, but also the general joke of that is, ha ha ha, they're so weird, I'm glad they're not them. I don't find that funny. I find that like at worst really mean um, and at best just really anxiety inducing. Like I feel like I should be watching this and taking notes and learning from their mistakes because I could end up in that situation rather than enjoying how silly and absurd they are because most of the things they do seem pretty logical to me or I know other autistics that genuinely act like that. Um, and it feels too real and it makes me very, very anxious. So I don't laugh because I'm stressed. Like with comedy, that's kind of a combo between cringe and something else. And the situation is so absurd and the characters are such caricatures that it feels really detached from reality. I might find that funny, um, but you're never gonna see me sitting and laughing at The Office or Parks and Rec, even though I did watch all of The Office and I still don't know why I did that. Um, but speaking of The Office, I read an article comparing how The Office handles jokes about disability and how disabled comedian Lawrence Clark handles jokes about disability, which I found really, really interesting. So we're gonna quote from it. While both shows humiliate the non-disabled for their reactions toward disabled people, the work they are doing differs on several accounts. While The Office does not give its disabled characters much of a voice and thus remains ambiguous in what it is doing, Clark's performances use cringe humor as a tool to reclaim agency. My personal favorite bit of Lawrence Clark's, which I'll link a video of in the description, is Kill All the Puppies, um, where he goes out in his wheelchair with a red bucket that is labeled 
kill all the puppies to see if people will donate to him because he's just a disabled person in a wheelchair with a bucket on the street. It is so hilarious. I love it so much. That is dark humor done correctly. Again, linked in the description, go check it out. But anyway, in my descriptions of what autistic people in, well, in general, based on my experience and research and conversations with other people, autistics are not a monolith. You'll inevitably find somebody who watches this video who's autistic and will go, I disagree with everything that came out of Sydney's mouth. That's valid. But generally what autistics find funny and don't find funny, what generally tends to be a winner is comedy that is easy to follow, not mean or cringy, or if it is, it's so incredibly dialed up to like 300% that the whole situation is so absurd that you don't make really feel for the characters. And it's easy to tell what is a joke and what is not a joke. And that brings us to my friend Commedia dell'arte, which um, I studied abroad um, in Italy last fall. Not to be like, back when I studied abroad, but I did. Um, and when I studied abroad, we had three weeks of intensive Commedia training with uh, Dr. Chiara Dana. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I've never had to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry, Chiara. Um, she's one of my favorite people. And those three weeks were the best three weeks of my program by far. I love Commedia way too much for my own good. Honestly, 99% of that was probably because Chiara was the best professor that, that we had when I was there. Um, she has a YouTube channel of how to do comedia and movement stuff. I'll link it in the description for you. You should definitely check it out. Also, if you're watching this, hi Kiara. I love you. I miss you. You're the best. And if I don't do comedia justice in this video, because it's kind of hard to explain in short form or, or medium length form content, I'm really sorry. I'm trying my best. Okay, so Comedia dell'arte roughly translates to like the artisanship profession of comedy, kind of. Um, that doesn't really matter because around the world it is known by its Italian name, so it doesn't really matter what it translates to. Commedia's official birthday is February 25th, 1545. The direct origins of it are not quite known, but it probably kind of evolved from Italian farce troops. All art kind of builds and expands on each other and comedic archetypes have been a thing since like ancient Greece and ancient Rome. So just know that this was a very, very big deal for society. Um, basically, Commedia troops were groups of actors that formed the first known commercial theater companies because they were kind of the first actors to make it their sole profession, if not the first. The thing is, is a lot of uh, narratives that we see of theater history and it's like, this is the first time this happened, completely ignores the fact that it was very much happening in like Sanskrit drama um, and like other stuff in, in Asia and other parts of the world. So it, saying this is the first thing, I feel like I can't totally, totally confidently say that. But anyway, they would travel around Italy, which was not unified at this point at all whatsoever. It was just a bunch of like different uh, provinces or dukies, duchies, however you pronounce that. They put on shows in Piazze. Those were the squares in the center of town. And one of the things about Commedia is that while it is low comedy street performance, it's also very witty high comedy at the same time. And once Commedia became a major sensation, they would perform both in the streets for commoners and everybody else, and also on stages for very high profile people, which I think is really, really cool. And what I also think is really cool is that Commedia was the first time in Western culture, as far as we know, that women acted on stage. And uh, that's pretty awesome. And also they did not have scripts or directors, which is also cool, but we're, we're gonna get to that in a second. Commedia as a form of theater is highly physicalized. So each character, mask, archetype, whatever you want to call it, has a very specific physicality that was very strictly learned by the actors and studied by the actors. Each actor was like, this is the one character that I study. Some of them, I think they all like knew the different, um, the different physicalities, obviously you know all of them, but were specialized in one. Also, these characters had masks. They are half masks, so they cover just the top of your face and nose so you can very easily um, speak. And each character has their own specified mask. But the thing is about these masks is that there are many different versions of each character mask. I will put some on screen for you. Um, but each character has their own specific, like, this one is modeled after this animal. It has these general features, but there's like hundreds of thousands of different ways that you can model that character. So you can look at 12 different masks and you can confidently know that three of those are Capitano and that like three of those are Dottore um, fairly easily, even though they are all very different from each other. The women character, since this was the first time that women were on stage, did not wear masks because we got to see how pretty the women are, obviously, because keep in mind that no matter, no matter what time in history, doing things solely for money and attention has been a thing for as long as humans have been alive. And I'm going to do a pretty short run through of the main characters just so you can picture some. You do not need to retain this. I'm just a nerd. Um, also, if you want to retain it, you're, you're welcome to. Um, oh, and one of the coolest things about Commedia is that various stock characters were created by various famous Commedia actors, and some are directly named after them. And each archetype kind of comes from a specific region of Italy so that they would have that accent and dialect of that place. So everybody would be kind of 
intermingled chaos of accents and dialects, which makes me very, very happy for some reason as like a linguist. Mm, so good. And as I said before, this is way before Italy was unified, but everybody was generally able to understand. Okay, anyway, moving on, stock characters. So first we have the servants. They are the Zani. Um, their sole motivation is that they want food and occasionally schmecks, but mostly food. They have a very low center of gravity. Um, they make a lot of guttural noises and they're usually not very smart. They represent the lower classes that migrated from the south of Italy to the north in search of work. They're usually really exploited workers. Um, and there are many stock characters within the Zani family, but you can also just be a Zani. Like a Zani is a, is a kind of Zani, if, if that makes sense. That is very much a thing. But traditionally there is a first Zani and a second Zani. And the first one is really cunning and astute and kind of knows what's up. And the second Zani is clumsy and naive and has not a single brain cell in his poor little brain. Some of the famous names that you may hear in this category um, and their general like characteristics include Brighella. He's kind of like a fox who's very focused on his personal interests. He usually carries a dagger, likes to swagger around. Ooh, that rhymed. Um, Puccinella, this one falls asleep a lot. He's fun. And Arlecchino, who's uh, mischievous, lighthearted, and playful. He bounces around a lot. If you're wondering where the word Harlequin or the idea of a Harlequin came from, came from Arlecchina and Arlecchino. Now you know. We also have the Servete in this category. La Serveta is a female servant. She's in love with Arlecchino and she is also very playful and quite intelligent. Usually the servant of the female lover. We'll get to that in a bit to who those characters are in a bit. She would not be masked because she is a woman. Um, and some of the famous Servette include Colombina, Franceschina, and Coralina. I would assume you would roll your R in that one because there's two R's in a row, but I can't roll my R's. Fun fact about me. Then we have Pantalone. He represents greed, avarice, and lust, and he's solely focused on mating. I really don't want to get demonetized. He gives off serious vulture vibes. That's kind of his inspo animal. Um, <laughs> It's boy animal. And he walks like an old man who's trying not to poop his pants. He, his voice is very, really annoying and, and nasally. He represents the economic and financial power and the highest authority of the household. He usually had a Venetian dialect because Venice was the trade capital of the time. If you're wondering where Merchant of Venice comes from, it's Pantalone. Next we have Dottore. He is a very pretentious and pompous guy, very fat, modeled after a pig. Basically picture Santa Claus walking around and going, ho, 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 slap a mask on top of that. That is effectively what the physicality looks like. It feels really sacrilegious to be explaining Comedia like this, but I make it accessible to the masses in a short period of time. Sorry. Anyway, I love the Tore because he's always like, oh yes, I am a professional and I know everything. Ho, 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 ho. But he knows absolutely nothing at all whatsoever. He just spews utter nonsense with the most confidence that the world has ever seen. It is wonderful. He represents intellectual power and is from Bologna because that is where the very first university was. Um, it's, it's great. Then we have the Amorossi or the Innamorati. This was mine. <laughs> Yay. They're a pair, neither wear masks. There's the female and the male lover, traditionally. Um, so that is Amorosa Innamorata and Amoroso Innamorato. That's how Italian works. They are commonly named Lelio or Flavio and Isabella or Flaminia. They represent vanity and narcissism. Think Romeo and Juliet. They're absurdly in love with each other, but kind of more in love with themselves. They're way over dramatic. Definitely, definitely need to chill. And they're also so horny all the time, but they do not understand that concept at all because they are oh so innocent. And that gives so much opportunity for them to make the most inappropriate and raunchy jokes completely straight faced. And it is, truly wonderful. Like they'll just, they'll just say wildly inappropriate things and have no clue. Um, they're the children of Pantalone and Dottore and they speak in verse and they finish each other's sentences and they talk in the Italian equivalent of an American trying to talk like the queen. Super posh, super dramatic. They move like they're in their own individual ballet, truly extra, lots of screaming, usually pretend to faint and or kill themselves at least three times a show. My character was Isabella, but we named her Francesca because my servant was Franceschina and my male lover was Francesco. We were really proud of that. We'll get to my Comedia shenanigans in a bit. Anyway, I love the female lover. It's my favorite. I embody her sometimes and it's wonderful. Our last character is Il Capitano and he's Gaston. Uh, just imagine Gaston. He is the most arrogant, I am a womanizing manly man character. But then when he sees a mouse, he screams like a little girl. He's often portrayed with a Spanish accent. He is always the outsider. He's going to show up like, here are all the great and powerful things that I've done. And it's wonderful because he's done absolutely none of those things. And his ego is so fragile and we love to see it. He existed to make fun of the military power of the time. Um, we had a scene with a surfer dude bro Capitano and it was my favorite thing. It was truly wonderful. So that's your rudimentary breakdown of the characters. Obviously there are so many more than that and there's so much more in-depth stuff that we could talk about. 
we're not gonna do that because we don't have time. Now, uh, we we do know the the general characters now, so let's let's talk about structure. What's cool about Commedia is, as I said earlier, they did not have directors or scripts. They had a scenario that was usually broken into a prologue, three acts, and an epilogue. And between each act, there would be an intermezzo, which is an intermission of sorts that was dancing and singing, usually done by the actors in character in their masks, whole thing. Once you put that mask on your face, you are physically embodying that mask the whole time until it gets taken off. It's like you respect the mask. And then within that set structure, right, they had a general idea of the story they were gonna tell, the general structure of what happens after the next thing, after the next thing. They would memorize small sections of text like monologues or dialogues or anything else. And from there, they would kind of just go and and do it. And when we uh, did Commedia, we did it the same way. Every performance was slightly different because we were always changing bits and adding bits and removing pieces and shifting small things around. And I would assume that with a troupe that had been together for years and been traveling and performing for years, you could be way more free with your improvisations because you knew like how everybody else worked on stage. And frankly, we improvised Commedia scenes just in the hallway between classes for fun sometimes. So I feel like if we had done that for a couple months, things would have gotten wild. Now, one specific physical thing that is important about Commedia is clocking or corpo di maschero, which is basically the head, aka the mask. Um, even if you don't have a physical mask on your face, it is still the mask. It is a sharp movement in one direction, and then the body will rotate and it will follow in that direction. This is often used for comedic effect, such as when two characters get into a weird situation and then they both freeze, they will look at each other, and then they will look at the audience, and then they will look back at each other, and it's always super sharp and crisp and on beats, and you can kind of feel that pulse the more that you actually do it. But that, like, oh dear, we're in a situation, oh dear, we're in a situation, oh my goodness. That adds so much to your comedy. Commedia also had running lazzi, which are gags, usually fairly physical and also totally unrelated to the plot, but they appear throughout the scenario. Um, the most famous one is the zani and the fly lazzo, where a fly will buzz around and the zani will try to catch it to have it as a snack because it's so hungry. Um, I have included a link in the description to a 20-ish minute scenario that I found online. It is in English, it really embodies the entire messy, intertwined, beautiful, fast-paced, utter chaos that is Comedia dell'arte um, that I'm, I'm doing a very bad job of explaining here. It is not picture perfect Comedia, but I hope that it will give you the general idea of the vibes and I still really enjoyed it. Also, Comedia became a worldwide hit. You may be looking at all these archetypes and being like, didn't, didn't Shakespeare, mm-hmm. Yeah, he did. I have a conspiracy theory that everything Shakespeare ever wrote was effectively stolen from Comedia. That's halfway a joke, but he did get a ton of his ideas from Commedia, as did Moliere and Lope de Vega, because it was a very large deal. It was a culture sensation for like hundreds of years. It still kind of is. So you would expect <laughs> that it would appear in everybody else's art. Obviously, Commedia is not a perfect art form. The poorer characters are very often less intelligent, and the poor and less intelligent characters are usually ones with physical deformities or atypicalities or disabilities. It is common that the more stupid the masks are, such as Pulcinella, Tartaglia, or Coviello, the more physically deformed they are. It's like their deformed train of thought takes physical form. And there's also discussion to be had about Pantalone as a potentially anti-Semitic character. Um, but he was not created that way. It's just what Shakespeare did with the Merchant of Venice. So that's good. And yes, there also is the question of, hmm, are we laughing at caricatures of intellectually disabled people to feel better than them? But I also think that the beauty of Commedia is how far removed from everything else it feels. Like it feels like a complete and utter different world. It's almost carnivalesque. Um, I say almost. Commedia was very much involved in traditional carnivale um, in Italy. So it, it is carnivalesque, um, but it feels like a complete and utter different world and different plane of existence that this is happening on. So you don't really internalize these stereotypes as much because you're very aware that these are stereotypes. Like you are specifically watching this and going, oh, these are two dimensional archetypes. And that's what makes it funny. Chiara always explained to us it's like, Putting on one of the masks is kind of like you're a puppet. Like you you are the body that is operating the mask and your brain is still 100% switched on. And from the audience, you can kind of tell that in a good way. It's, you are distanced from it on some level. And the thing is, looping back to autism for a moment, caricature by definition is going to present as neuroatypical because we categorize neuroatypicality as too much, too little, the extremes of what is normal. And caricatures embody those extremes to a comedic point. And we also see this in Clown as well. I can't remember when my review of Mr. Bean is coming out, um, but he embodies this perfectly. And for some people studying Comedia or Clown, this characterization can feel reductive and stereotypical. Like for me, when I was studying Clown, I really struggled because I felt like I was just acting like a younger version of myself and I was getting 
laughed at for acting like a natural younger version of myself and that just reignited old trauma of being laughed at for who I was. But for other autistics and disabled people, they love doing clown because they're not afraid of being laughed at because the whole point is to be laughed at and it's how they are able to try new things and reclaim when they get to be laughed at and what they're being laughed at for. Kind of like how we talked about in the history of freak shows, how a lot of disabled people felt like they were reclaiming that identity. But why are we talking about Commedia and what does this have to do with the original point of the video? We're almost there. We're so close, I promise. First, we need to look at how Commedia has influenced pop, pop, hem, hem, popular comedic, comedic, not comedic, oh darn it, English and Italian are hard, popular comedic culture. Slapstick comedy, my friends. The slapstick itself actually originated in Commedia, but a cookie cutter example of Commedia that most everybody knows is Gilligan's Island. Um, the humor is very physical and they have almost all of the archetypes on the island. It is not like picture perfect Commedia, but yeah, Gilligan and Skipper are Zani, Gilligan is the second Zani, um, the professor is Dottore, Thurston Hell the third is Pantalone, and also like a little bit of Dottore. Um, Marianne is a sort of Cerveta or female lover, and Ginger could be female lover, etc. Obviously it's not a perfect delineation between Commedia characters, and you could argue that some, many of them are combinations of two characters, but it is effectively a TV show about Commedia archetypes that all just got dropped into a scenario together. and. Most everything from this era, particularly golden age Hollywood, is made in the general physical comedy commedia dell'arte style of comedy. A more modern example of this is The Goes Wrong Show, or the play that goes wrong, um, which is kind of like a commedia scenario within another play, if that makes sense. Like, every actor has their archetype, and that archetype has to pretend to be an actor in a show, and then the show itself goes wrong, and it becomes absolute chaos because of all of the clashing situations. Also, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I will link it for you in the description. It's all on Amazon Prime and you need to watch it. It's so funny. Um, but what does this have to do with autism? Accessibility. Slapstick is the most accessible form of humor. I will argue this for the rest of my life. Sure, people get hurt or insulted, but it's so obviously a character on top of a real person that it feels very removed from regular emotion. All of the actions and situations and emotions are made very obvious so you know what's happening. For example, I grew up loving The Music Man and Singing in the Rain specifically because of how much of that was, oh, also My Fair Lady, because of how much of that was physical comedy and how much you could tell what emotions the characters were trying to show because of how over-exaggerated it was. This type of humor is also really common in films and TV for children because it's easy to follow and easy to understand, which children need just based on how their brains function. And if you know the wider social context, you're gonna get some of the wittier jokes that are also in children's media in addition to the fun physical comedy, but also if you don't get those things, you can still thoroughly enjoy every piece of it. And it's so fast paced that if you miss a joke, you don't feel bad about missing the joke because you're already on to the next really obvious this is a joke joke. In the sense of 60s and 70s TV and movies, they often included songs and movies and fun costumes, Children's TV also does this, um, which makes it extra engaging in the sense of visual sensory input. And because of the gender rules of what was acceptable to be on TV at the time, it is also usually family friendly and doesn't touch on many triggering concepts. So when I was sitting in a rehearsal room watching my friends put together the comedia scenes and I was laughing so hard I was actively crying, I started to piece all of these together, how this is related to like, I love Lucy and how I grew up on that and I found that funny and I didn't like modern TV and why that is. And I've always been teased for how much I love old movie musicals and children's movies and how childish that makes me seem and how out of touch I am. And even though I know that there's nothing wrong with being childish or out of touch, it always kind of bothered me on some level. And Comedia made me realize that this is because when it comes to comedic fictional media, Comedia style humor is what is most accessible for how my brain functions and how I see the world. I know the general characters, I know the general arc of how things are going to go, so it's less stressful and confusing, and if I zone out with auditory processing, I can still very clearly figure out what is going on because of the simplicity of the characters and the plot, but also there's so many shenanigans going on, it's complicated enough to keep me engaged and wondering what's going to happen next. Everyone's emotions are so over the top, I can very easily figure out what characters are feeling, and it helped me to learn social skills, and also there are songs with dances and pretty colors, which is a nice stim break throughout, and the stories are very rarely triggering or upsetting, or if they are, it's resolved fairly quickly, and I understand the jokes. I find it funny because the funny things that are meant to be funny make sense, and so they are funny to me. And with the rise of nihilism in our society, recent humors become a lot more sarcastic and satire heavy, so the physical comedy stuff that we see is mostly in old cinema and children's media, which is why if you ask autistics about our favorite media, you're usually gonna hear us say, oh, it's documentaries or absurd over-the-top comedy. 
looking at you, Monty Python, children's content, or based on stock characters from books or something else. That's the kind of media where we don't feel like we are constantly missing the point, like we're being thrown into the deep end with a lot of new things to process at once and we feel included and we can have a good time with everybody else. And I don't know why it took me becoming a very angry, dramatic, heterosexual ballet girl named Francesca in Italy for me to figure this out about myself and the world around me, but it's something that I have been reflecting on pretty much over the last year or so, because Commedia keeps coming up in my life and appearing because it's everywhere, oh my goodness. Um, but I'm really excited that I've now gotten the chance to share this with you. So let me know what you think. As always, I would love to hear your opinions and experiences here. I have linked so many things in the description for you on this topic. If you're further interested, Commedia is a very fun rabbit hole to go down and I highly recommend. Definitely check out the Commedia scenario. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and yeah, as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over. I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.